Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, I'm Jim Babineau from the Austin office of Fisher Richardson. I'm joined by uh, Tim French uh, from the Boston office and Jan Zekia from the Munich office. And we're hoping to, within the next hour, help you to understand uh, how the new IDR system, or as it relates to now U.S. applicants, uh, can be used uh, effectively. So um, I, I do want to uh, uh, note up in front that we're going to, again, we're going to run 60 minutes. Uh, we will try to save time at the end for questions. Um, we, we may go over a little bit with the questions at the end, and we apologize if that happens. Um, there will be some CLE uh, things that happen. There will be um, a CLE code that comes up uh, during the presentation for those of you in New York requiring CLE credit. Uh, and of course, I, I do have to say up front that the content of this presentation is really for educational purposes, does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson, and is not intended to address every situation you, that may come up. So with that, uh, let us jump right in. <clears throat> so uh, as an intro here, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with respect to what uh, we mean by design protection. We're not talking about the standard uh, run-of-the-mill patents that uh, protect ideas that can be articulated in words. Uh, rather, design protection focuses on the appearance or ornamentation of something and not its function. Um, so uh, the, <clears throat> traditionally we protect by design patent or by design registration, uh, three-dimensional object designs, uh, patterns. Also now in the electronic age, things like fonts and icons and even animated icons. Um, in a regular utility patent, again, the protection is determined by the wording of the claims, whereas in design protection, uh, of any sort, the scope of protection is, is by what you see in the drawings. Um, we say sometimes about design protection that it is a, a, a sort of a crux between uh, policies and ideas related to patenting, uh, trademark, and copyright. Uh, by patenting, we, you know, in the U.S., traditionally, we have protected designs by design patent. Um, and like uh, regular patents, design patent infringement doesn't require any sort of intent, you can be totally innocent and happen to come up with a design and produce a design that infringes <clears throat> an issued US design patent. Um, so it's like patent in that way. Uh, it doesn't require copying or any sort of competition in the marketplace. It is like trademark though, in that, uh, for example, in the US, the test for infringement uh, references determining similarities between the protected design and the commercial design that are sufficient to potentially cause confusion. That sounds a lot like a trademark infringement test. Um, and regarding copyright, in the US, uh, Congress has seen fit to give statutory damages. In fact, uh, infringers, the for total infringers profits uh, due to infringement as a minimum uh, remedy uh, in the case of design patent infringement. So um, as we've seen from some recent court cases, design patents are becoming a little more uh, important, perhaps, uh, in the grand scheme of things. So uh, in the U.S., I mentioned design patents. You've probably seen these if you're familiar with uh, uh, U.S. patents. These are the ones that the number will begin uh, with a letter D, or in the case of the one shown on the screen, uh, DES. These are issued by the patent office after being examined to determine whether the design being claimed is novel and non-obvious. Uh, once they're granted, they have 15-year term now, uh, used to be 14 years, and they have a presumption of validity, and there are no maintenance fees required. Uh, I want to distinguish between patent systems for protecting designs and registration systems because um, those of you familiar with U.S. patenting will find this IDR process a little bit odd. Um, in the U.S., when we protect a design by patent, uh, we're protecting a design concept. Uh, it's a concept underlying a design, not the particular design itself. Because of this, you can put multiple embodiments, technically, in a U.S. design application, and you can protect the concept that, that underlines or breathes life into all of them. So, for example, on the screen, you see four different vessels, each with a very similar handle concept. And if you were to put all four of these into one design patent application, um, you could claim uh, broadly enough that if someone came up with another vessel that's not shown here, but with a similar design handle, you could assert potential infringement. Um, 
The European Union, on the other hand, has operated for years on a registration system in which specific designs are protected. Uh, you can put multiple designs in a European Union uh, uh, design registration. Uh, for example, you could put all four of these potentially in the same registration, but you would be protecting each one individually and not the underlying concept. Um, again, in the U.S. system, we'd have an examination for validity and a presumption of validity. Uh, in the European registration system, on the other hand, there's no examination for anything other than formalities. Uh, and it's not determined until it's challenged, perhaps in an enforcement, um, whether or not the design was even new. We bring this up because the IDR system is going to have flavors of the European Union system uh, for U.S. applicants. So up until now, when you, when you wanted to protect uh, your design as a U.S. Uh, inventor, in both the U.S. and in other countries, you would file a U.S. design application. And under the Paris Convention, you have a six-month priority window to try to protect that design similarly in other countries and have those national patent applications examined on the basis of your U.S. filing date. So along this timeline, at six months, you would file separate applications in these three countries, countries A, B, and C. Um, some of which may operate under a registration system and simply register the design without examination, some of which may uh, examine against the prior art and may, may offer, may give you a rejection. So that's what we're familiar with. So now to get into the Hague Agreement. Um, what we mean by the Hague Agreement really is it's a, it's a nomenclature we use to describe a system of, of acts, a set of acts that started back in 1934. There's been three of them. Uh, 1934, 1960, and 1999, you can ignore the 1934 Act for all intents and purposes after about 2010. It's fairly irrelevant. But each act had different countries involved. Now there's a total of 64 countries involved in The Hague. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, has now become a member. In fact, the U.S. and Japan both joined last month, and that's why I'm sure you're, you're interested in this topic. Um, notably, there are key countries that are WTO members, etc. that are not part of this agreement. The most significant one on this list perhaps is China, where a lot of companies are finding they want to have design protection. Uh, you cannot uh, protect a design in China through the Hague. Also Brazil, Australia, Singapore, Russia, Taiwan, uh, Israel, and Canada. So what does the Hague uh, agreement allow? It allows an applicant to file one application uh, to protect a design in several countries. The application filed with WIPO, the same organization that manages the PCT. Um, in the filing, you have to designate each country where you'd like to ultimately get protection. And because it's a registration system, uh, WIPO publishes the design, notifies the countries that you have opted to have protection in their country, and then countries have the ability to uh, refuse the protection. And notably, if a country doesn't refuse the protection, the protection is valid in that country. Uh, just to mention some country levels that will be more of, an, uh, of interest later in the discussion, um, the agreement is set up to have three levels. There's, we talk about country levels, level one countries, or countries uh, that just protect the design immediately upon registration. And there are a number of those. Level two countries, uh, we'll do their own formality uh, review, et cetera, but we'll not examine the design to see if it's new. Uh, level three country is a country that will do a full <clears throat> validity examination. So as you can imagine, the U.S. Uh, has signed on as a level three country. So the way foreign protection works via the Hague, again, you'd have the U.S. filing, which could be a U.S. design patent application. Six months later is your priority window to file with the Hague. And uh, again, upon filing, those, those level one countries would, uh, or upon registration with the Hague, the level one countries would be protected. The level three countries, on the other hand, uh, would be notified and have up to 12 months uh, to refuse. To, just to compare this with PCT, because this is, a, this is probably a, a very important point to grasp today. Under PCT, which most of us may be familiar with, 
uh, when you get to the end of the PCT process, you file national stage applications or you nationalize the PCT application in various countries and you proceed uh, separately in each of those countries. Under the Hague, uh, WIPO retains, if you will, ultimate jurisdiction over the application in maintaining it, et cetera. It does not transfer to the individual countries. Uh, this is, if you will, if you want to think about it this way, this is a harmonization of the formalities, but not a harmonization as to substance. So, why why worry about all this? Uh, you might be thinking, with well, my goodness, there's 1960 countries and 1999 countries, and, and there's level one countries, level two countries. Why why worry about all this? Why would anyone go through all this when we already have design patents? Well, it's primarily because of cost. Ultimately, if you if you think about national design patents, um, you you have of course you have the filing pre the preparation fees, the filing fees, the prosecution fees in each country. You have grant fees in some countries. You have annuities. Under the Hague, you have a single filing fee initially, um, and Tim will walk through some examples of that uh, with designation fees. And then you have uh, renewals every five years, for ultimately for a life of 15. Um, so, if you were to think about well, what is the what does this cost? Those of you who manage portfolios, if you had one design you wanted to protect in six countries, and let's say six level two countries here, moderate countries, uh, in, the, in the design patent uh, mode, you would probably be spending over the life of the patents, perhaps something like forty to $50,000 by the time you were done. Uh, whereas through the Hague, the total cost, of course, this is all minus the preparation cost potentially, uh, would be under $2,000. So as you can see, if the Hague fits your commercial interests, it can be a very, very inexpensive alternative uh, to protecting designs. So <clears throat> let's walk through just quickly a little bit of, a, of a, an overview of the procedure. Um, when a patent application, or excuse me, a de design registration application is filed with WIPO, WIPO examines it for formalities. There's a lot of formalities. There are specific drawing requirements, specific uh, sub, you know, for formality requirements that uh, for many U.S. practitioners are new. So you'll have to rely on your outside counsel or uh, spend some time really going through the pages and pages of regulations to know what they are. Um, but they'll, they'll examine for formalities and then they will publish it in the register um, and provide notice to the various countries you designated that it's now open for uh, refusal. And then Countries either have six months or if they've elected to be a 12-month country, they have 12 months uh, to formally refuse. They will refuse by, um, by basically sending notice to WIPO that they're refusing and the WIPO notifies the applicant. And then applicant has uh, time to respond directly with the country and try to resolve that, that issue. Um, but because this, this application is not proceeding within the national country, you're not making amendments to drawings, for example, which is one of the primary things you do under U.S. prosecution now, uh, because those drawings are as WIPO received them, uh, and they're they're managed by WIPO. Um, and then once it's once the registration has happened, the, the, it's been published. Every five years, you have a a fee that you have to pay to keep it going. The U.S. has opted out of this, of course, so that uh, if you register a design through this process you get a full 15-year term without paying additional fees, similar to a U.S. Uh, design patent. Um, so for U.S. applicants, uh, and this took some time to work through under the treaty, so it's, it's taken a while for the U.S. to get on board with this, but uh, you can file directly with the IB, WIPO, like you can with a PCT application. Um, of course, that's, that's how most other countries deal with with, uh, with the Hague. Uh, the U.S. Patent Office, however, has uh, been authorized to accept application filings. Uh, and as we'll talk about later in the uh, presentation, it's going to be strongly recommended for most, in most cases that if you have an invention or design that was conceived or produced, developed in the U.S., uh, the foreign filing license requirements are still the same. And so if you file instead with the USPTO, uh, the USPTO will, will, will 
give you a filing receipt, if you will. We'll, we'll determine that, the, that there's a, a, no problem with security and give a filing license. I'll give you, assign a filing date based on the U.S. Uh, filing date, mailing date uh, uh, rubric. But then the U.S. Patent Office does nothing more than forward it to the IB and charge you $120. And then the IB takes over from there. Uh, filing with the USPTO is a requirement if you want to later convert a Hague application into a regular U.S. design application, which is something we'll talk about. Either approach, uh, the applicant can claim priority from a U.S. application, design application, or foreign application within that six-month window and can designate the U.S. now as one of the countries in which protection is sought. So, Tim, over to you. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, this is Tim French in, uh, in our Boston office. Uh, I've been charged with providing a brief overview of the nuts and bolts of securing design protection under the Hague Agreement. Uh, briefly, I'm going to cover uh, filing requirements under the Hague Agreement, uh, the filing of an IDA, that is an international design application, as a U.S. applicant, uh, the International Bureau IB process, proceeding in the designated states, and then close with the post-IDR procedures in the U.S. Uh, Filing requirements under the Hague Agreement, who can file? Uh, any person who is a national of a member state that is a contracting party uh, to the Hague Agreement or of a state member of an intergovernmental organization, for example, a RIPO uh, and others, that is a contracting party, or that has a domicile, residence, or a real and effective industrial or commercial establishment in a contracting state. As Jim mentions, mentioned, uh, we have presently have 64 uh, member countries and states. Uh, the trend is, uh, is gaining. Uh, at the, with the uh, domicile and residence uh, provisions, uh, members, uh, uh, residents of other countries also have the opportunity. Where do you file? Uh, the Hague Agreement allows uh, filing either directly with the International Bureau or through the office of the applicant's contracting party, if uh, under the accession uh, that uh, that option is made available. And as Jim mentioned, the International Design Registration can claim priority of six months under the Paris Convention from any application that's filed in any convention country. Uh, the filing requirements or the mandatory requirements of the uh, application for IDR under the, the Hague Agreement uh, includes a request, uh, prescribed informa uh, information concerning the applicant, uh, prescribed number of copies of a reproduction that is a drawing of the subject design, an indication of the product or products that will constitute the design, an indication of the designated contracting states parties where protection will be sought, and uh, the prescribed fee, and any other of the prescribed particulars. International design applications are, uh, for a U.S. applicant are subject to the secrecy provisions of Part 5 of the rules. That is, a foreign filing license is required prior to filing outside the U.S. Uh, this leaves a U.S. applicant uh, essentially with two filing options. First, uh, the application can be filed indirectly, that is, through a U.S. PTO filing. Uh, which, after uh, review by the USPTO, is communicated to the IB, uh, that communication being uh, after the foreign filing license has been granted. Uh, the other option is to file directly. Uh, in this case, uh, if you were to file a U.S. design application, uh, allow that application to pend to the, at least to the point of securing a foreign filing license, then you'd be free to proceed with filing an IDR directly uh, in the IB as a convention application. And again, the convention period for design is six months. The other option is to uh, apply directly to the uh, USPTO uh, for obtaining a foreign filing license without filing a U.S. application. Uh, and that typically can take uh, a week or two, but uh, generally not longer than that. Uh, additional application requirements for designation of uh, declared examining offices, uh, which includes the U.S., uh, you're required to provide the identity of the creator or the designer. Uh, you are required to provide a brief description of the reproduction or of the characteristic features of the design, which is the subject of the application. 
and you're also required to provide a claim. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with U.S. design practice, uh, the, the form of the claim is, is quite simple for designs. Uh, for example, the design of a watch is described and shown is, uh, is more than sufficient. Uh, I, I struggled a little bit with, with providing the drawing requirements here because it's a little lengthy and I will move through them quickly, but uh, hopefully in enough detail to provide a flavor of their importance to the process. Of course, the heart and the most and most of the substance of the design registration is in the drawings. Uh, it's important to note that uh, US IDR rules do not provide design requirement, uh, drawing requirements, but rather adopt the, adopt the drawing requirements of the Hague Agreement and whole cloth. Uh, specifically, for US drawing requirements under Rule 37 CFR 1.1026, uh, it's provided that reproductions drawings shall comply with Rule 9 of the Common Regulations and Part 4 of the uh, Administrative Instructions. Uh, and these uh, WIPO rules uh, provide that uh, the application must have a single copy of the reproductions or drawings. Uh, they can be black and white or they can be in color. Uh, they can be pasted or printed on A4 paper, uh, white opaque paper held upright. Uh, the maximum number of figures per page is 25, and the figures must be arranged in orientation for publication, that is, in numerical order. Uh, each figure must fall within a right-angled quadrilateral containing no other figure or part of a figure and no numbering. And those familiar with our design patent system or uh, U.S. patent drawings gen in general will recognize that as being somewhat different. Uh, the photos and reproductions shall represent the industrial design alone or the product in relation to which the design is to be used. Uh, and and uh, that is uh, to the exclusion of any other object, accessory, person, or animal showing in the figures. The representations, drawings, uh, each figure must not exceed 16 by 16 centimeters. That's about 6.5 by 6.5 inches. But with respect to at least one representation, at least one dimension must be at least 3 centimeters, which is only about a, an inch and a quarter. Uh, the margins must be at least five millimeters. Uh, technical drawings, uh, particularly with axes and dimensions and explanatory text or legends in the representation, uh, will not be accepted. Uh, matter shown in a reproduction but for which protection is not sought uh, can be indicated either in the textual description of the application or by means of dotted broken lines or by coloring. Photographs, if they're used, must be a professional standard, and the picture design must appear against a neutral background. Uh, retouching of photographs with ink or correcting fluid is not allowed. Uh, the industrial design may comprise shading or hatching to provide relief. And the numbering of reproductions uh, must appear in the margin, again, a, a marked difference from U.S. and uh, other foreign patent practice. Uh, and they may be accompanied by legends to indicate a specific view, for example, front view, top view, et cetera. Uh, when the same industrial design is represented from different angles, the numbering of the views shall take the form of 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, et cetera, for the first design, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3 for the second design, and so on. And once again, the reproductions must be presented in numerical order in the application. Looking now to USPTO review of the indirect application, uh, the, UP, the USPTO will review the applicant's entitlement to file through the USPTO and will also confirm payment of the transmittal fee, which is a fee uh, that uh, is designated for the USPTO, and also performs a national security review for the purposes of granting the foreign filing license. If these three conditions are met, uh, then the USPTO will transmit the application to the International Bureau. The applicant thereafter will receive notice of the transmittal and of the international design application receipt date. If these three conditions are not met, uh, the USPTO will not transmit the application to the International Bureau, uh, but the USPTO will notify the applicant of the reasons why the application wasn't transmitted. Uh, it's important to note that subsequent to trans notice trans uh, transmittal, uh, the response to any invitation received by the applicant from the International Bureau must be sent directly to the International Bureau, 
in order to avoid abandonment or other loss of rights under the Hague Agreement. The USPTO cautions that it generally will not forward any communications to the International Bureau received after the design application has been transmitted. Uh, so that's an important uh, issue to note. Uh, the IB process, uh, the IB is, is solely responsible for ensuring that every application meets all requirements of form and formality prior to the international design registration and publication. Uh, the application can, applications under the IB process can include up to 100 designs in a single application. However, all must belong to the same class of the international Locarno classification. Uh, all international design fees have to be paid directly to WIPO. Indirect fee, uh, filing fees, example, through the USPTO, as I mentioned, incurs an additional transmittal fee, which is set and paid to the contracting party. Designation fees are set by level examination, as discussed below, are dispersed uh, by the International Bureau to the respective designated states. Uh, the IB, under the IB process uh, continuing, uh, the International Bureau review, uh, reviews the international design application for formal matters and, if appropriate, accords a filing date pursuant to Article 9 and Rules 13 and 14. Uh, the International Bureau will not accord a filing date if the application is not in one of the prescribed languages, that is, English, French, or Spanish, or if it's missing any of the following elements, uh, an indication that the international application is made under the Hague Agreement, uh, a sufficient indication of the applicant's identity, a sufficient indication to allow the applicant or its representative to be contacted. Uh, again, the reproduction or specimen, that is the drawing of each industrial design is to be subject of the application, and the designation of at least one contracting party. If the application lacks any of these elements, uh, the filing date will be the date the International Bureau receives the omitted element. So you will not be entitled to your filing date until all aspects are, are provided and the IB agrees that you've met all the requirements of form. Uh, if you do not, then they will contact you or, or send you a deficiency notice uh, setting a date for reply. If you reply in a timely fashion, you'll get the date of the submittal. If you don't, then the application will lapse. A standard publication of the international registration by WIPO is six months after the date of the international registration, that is, after all re requirements for formality are met, or as soon as possible after the six months. Uh, an applicant has the, uh, an opportunity to request immediate publication, uh, in which case publication will occur uh, immediately after international registration or as soon as the publication can be prepared. Uh, applicants also uh, have the opportunity to instead request deferment of publication. Uh, under the Hague Agreement, that extension can be up to 30 months from the priority date or from the filing date where there's no priority. Uh, however, uh, deferment of publication is not permitted if the uh, application designates a contracting party that does not permit deferred publication, which includes the United States. Uh, in addition, some contracting parties uh, have by uh, their adoption have limited the period of deferment to less than 30 months. Uh, notice of the international registration is, commuted, is communicated directly to the designated offices upon publication. Uh, turning now to proceedings in the designated states, uh, contracting parties are permitted to adopt other requirements that may or may not apply to the U.S. Uh, those uh, other uh, possibilities are spe uh, specified elements, uh, the inclusion of two or more designs in an application, and as I mentioned, the request for deferment of publication. Uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, each contracting party must declare itself as a either a level one state, i.e. with no examination, and a grant of the international registration automatically in that territory. Uh, Level two states with, where there is limited examination conducted uh, with no consideration as to novelty, and level three states where examination includes uh, novelty, and of course the uh, U.S. has designated itself accordingly. Each of the designated contracting parties has the right to refuse the grant in its territory 
uh, protection to an international registration. Uh, such refusal uh, at the uh, decision of the contracting party may be total or it may be partial. Uh, that is applying to less than all the designs in the international registration. Uh, looking quickly now into the post-IDR proceedings in the U.S., uh, an international design application designating the U.S. can claim priority benefit under 35 U.S.C. 120, under 121, under 365C, the, the, uh, the, the PCT uh, sections, or 386C to an earlier application. Uh, in the U.S., uh, a U.S. applicant has the uh, right uh, upon lapse of an international design application to, for failure to act within the prescribed time limits uh, to be excused as to the U.S. upon petition to the U.S. PTO stating that the, the entire period uh, of delay was unintentional. Uh, it's expected that this would typically be a situation where certain requirements were raised by uh, the International Bureau during the international uh, review uh, and that for some reason that uh, information did not reach the uh, the applicant. Uh, so the applicant still in that uh, in that situation, the U.S. applicant still in that situation has the uh, opportunity to get protection at least in the U.S. Uh, international design applications designating the U.S. are examined on the merits and may be refused, but not on the grounds relating to form or content of the application, as the Hague Agreement provides that only the IB uh, has the ability to rule on form or content. Uh, only a single independent or distinct design can be claimed in the uh, international design application designating the U.S. Uh, any application not satisfying the requirements of this section uh, will be required to uh, restrict consideration in that application to a single independent and distinct design. Uh, however, any non-elected designs can subsequently be pursued through uh, divisional applications under the usual uh, procedures. Again, in the U.S., uh, prior art disclosure requirements apply, of course, uh, but IDS submittal should be deferred until after publication of the international registration. Uh, and as of the date of registration, uh, the three-month period uh, for filing an IDS without fee uh, is counted. And thereafter, of course, the standard uh, 37 CFR 1.97 rules apply for submittal of uh, prior art that subsequently becomes uh, known to the applicant. Uh, for applications filed to the USPTO as an Office of Indirect Filing, uh, the international design application will not be entitled to receive an international filing date uh, that is, the receipt of the international design by the USPTO. Uh, that only applies if the application is either not governed exclusively by the 1999 Geneva Act, that is, if the application designates uh, states that are members of the uh, earlier acts, or if the application is not received by the International Bureau within six months from the date of receipt by the USPTO. Uh, that would uh, most likely uh, occur when either a delay in obtaining a foreign filing license or a delay in, in responding to uh, defects found by the USPTO. Uh, applicants should include payment of the transmittal fee when submitting an international design application to the USPTO, uh, thereby to avoid delay in transmission of the application to the International Bureau. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, applicants should be cautious when filing through the USPTO not to designate a contracting party uh, that is only a party to the 1960 Hague Act and not to the 1999 Geneva Act. Uh, the international filing date is not necessarily the filing date of the international design application in the U.S. Uh, rather, the filing date of the international design application in the U.S. is the date of the international registration. Uh, Uh, an element of under Article uh, 5.2 is required with the international design application designates a contracting party that has made a declaration under Article 5.2 uh, 
that its natural, national law requires for filing, for example, an indication identifying the creator of the international design, uh, a brief description of the reproduction or characteristic features of the industrial design that's the subject of the application, and or a claim. Uh, and of course, the U.S. has made a declaration on all of these, uh, these items. Uh, U.S. applicants can petition under 371.1023B uh, for review of its U.S. filing date. Uh, the petition typically requires a showing that the international design application was entitled to the earlier date, uh, and of course, they must be accompanied by a fee. Uh, expedited examination under 37 CFR 1.155 is available for international design applications, but only if the des international design application has been published by WIPO. Uh, an international design application can also be converted to a design application under 35 U.S.C. Chapter 16, uh, pursuant to the provisions of the new rules. Uh, the international design application must have been filed with the USPTO as an Office of Indirect Filing. It must designate the U.S. and it must satisfy the requirements for filing date uh, filed under Chapter 16. Uh, in addition, uh, the petition must be filed prior to WIPO's p publication of the international registration, and it must be, again, accompanied by the petition fee. Uh, the U.S. will make examination of each international design registration designating the U.S., uh, and where it appears that the application is not entitled to the patent, it will notify the IB of the refusal within 12 months after publication of the international registration. Uh, setting a deadline for response. Note that the refusal is communicated to the IB rather than directly to the applicant. Uh, uh, pursuant to requirements of the Hague Agreement, a notification of the refusal is thereafter communicated uh, from the International Bureau uh, to the, uh, the applicant in the U.S. Uh, however, uh, beyond the fact that the notice of, uh, of rejection goes from the U.S., to the IB, to the applicant, uh, the applicant is required to communicate directly with the USPTO with respect to the rejection. Uh, U.S. rules applicable to replies to office actions and regular U.S. applications will apply, uh, including the requirement that the reply must be signed in accordance with the provision. Uh, there was some discussion initially uh, when the uh, U.S. was considering signing on to Hague uh, that a longer period would be, uh, a period beyond 12 months would be uh, a, an exception uh, to, the, to their adoption in order to avoid the situation of, uh, of applications immediately going to registration without going through uh, delayed examination. Uh, however, the alternative has been adopted uh, wherein uh, any application to be refused would be refused within the 12-month period it will stand refused uh, because the, the Hague uh, limits the uh, period to 12 months, uh, but the applicant will be able to uh, communicate with the USPTO and get that refusal uh, retracted, uh, which will thereafter be communicated by the, uh, by the U.S. office to, uh, to the IB. Uh, for your convenience, uh, at the end of this slide uh, presentation, uh, we, we're providing links to key reference documents and to key websites, uh, which we made available uh, in the slides that we made available after the conclusion of the presentation. I'm now going to pass uh, the baton along to Jan Zecker, uh, who's an experienced trademark European practitioner in our Munich office. Jan? Thank you, Tim. Hello, everybody. Some of you uh, might have seen the movie Blues Brothers, including the big showdown at the end where hundreds of police officers, state troopers, and National Guardsmen surround an office building. Well, that's exactly uh, what our office building in Munich looked like today when I returned from my lunch break. As it turned out, um, a police squadron is uh, staying in a hotel next door uh, for the upcoming G7 summit with uh, Barack Obama, amongst others, coming to Bavaria. I was uh, lucky enough to get back in our building, and I'm uh, really happy to be with you today. I will tell you uh, a little bit about 
uh, design filing strategies. Um, what you will see on this slide is a list of issues you will typically look into when preparing an international filing campaign. The first thing I would recommend uh, when a new design uh, hits your desk is to start a watch and to consider a search. Design watches are available. They are inexpensive, some hundred dollars a year. Um, they are not very common, uh, but they can be really helpful. Uh, first, to become aware of relevant prior art early enough and not in the middle of your filing campaign when you've already spent a ton of money. And second, uh, to become aware of infringing products early on. If you work in designs more often, you may uh, come across uh, what I call minefield applications. Um, a series of filings for very similar designs, only some of them used by the owner. An example is here on the slide. Now, is this a trick? Is this abusive? Um, generally speaking, uh, no, it is not. Um, there's no use requirement, uh, contrary to trademarks. Uh, you do not have to use your design to enforce it. Uh, so it can make perfect sense to come with a very um, broad filing strategy to cover all possible designs uh, you or your competitors uh, may be interested in. Of course, when you are doing this, uh, intentionally trying to corner your competitors, uh, this may be questionable. And uh, just for the sake of completeness, it is public record. I should mention that uh, the registered communities design, that's what the um, acronym RCD uh, on the slide stands for, uh, currently uh, is uh, being challenged. There's a cancellation proceeding pending. The next question I would look into when preparing uh, an international design filing, ca filing campaign is, was there already a related filing? You may find out sooner or later that there already was such a filing, namely for a utility patent. If so, you should check that utility patent application for figures. All figures which you can see on this slide here uh, were taken from published utility patent applications. The drawings here uh, may be sufficient for claiming a priority for design filings, at least in some jurisdictions. The good news is here that that means you may benefit from the early filing date of that utility patent application. The bad news is that the filing deadline, Jim Babino already mentioned it, it's a six month filing deadline, already may be close. And second, if there are related utility, related utility patent applications, whatever you do at the design side should not create issues at the utility patent side. So you should try to uh, discuss whatever you do at the design side with your colleagues handling the technical findings. Where do you want to file? Well, for a design filing campaign, for an international design filing campaign, of course, you'll have to come up with a list of countries of interest. Typically, you will file where you want to enforce, and that's, of course, where you uh, expect counterfeits uh, manufactured or sold. What you should check when you've come up with your list of uh, countries of interest it is whether priority claims are accepted. The good news is most countries will accept them, at least based on a design filing for another design filing. It may be more tricky than claiming the priority of a utility patent application for a design filing, what I just mentioned. What, I'd, what I would also uh, recommend to check is whether in your countries of interest a deferment of the publication of the design or of the full publication of the design is available. Um, you do not want to provide possible counterfeiters with uh, blueprints uh, by having a design published uh, before your own product launch. 
Another issue to check, was there already public disclosure? You should check whether the design has been made public, be it to a possible manufacturer, a potential customer, or to the public, for example, uh, through a product launch. Before product launch, uh, make sure to have all th third parties uh, to which you disclose your design sign confidentiality agreements. If your design is already public when you start working on an international filing uh, campaign, check whether your countries of interest have a novelty grace period. Some countries have them, others have not. Uh, in the US, I've been told it's uh, one year. In the European Union, it is 12 months. Everything disclosed during that period by the designer or his successor-in-law uh, does not question the novelty of the design. Now, should you file for a design which already is public where there's no grace period available? This is a sticky issue, as you'll see when reading quickly through the pros and cons I have on this slide. Um, the cons are obvious. Um, if your design is already public and if there's no novelty grace period available, uh, your design is not new. That means where the novelty is, exam ex is examined, uh, it's possible that you will get a refusal and uh, where novelty is not examined, your design will be registered, but it will be invalid and vulnerable to cancellation. In any case, uh, you should expect that your design registration will not survive litigation. Uh, for that reason, if you file nevertheless, if you try to enforce a registration granted for that filing, that may be seen as abusive, and in some countries there even might be sanctions. Having said that, uh, novelty is not examined in many jurisdictions uh, and the validity of your design registration is often presumed nevertheless. A design registration uh, often is sufficient for enforcement. For example, if you ask the customs to check shipments coming in a given country for counterfeits and if you have this shipment seized, it is very likely that your Chinese counterfeiters will not show up in court. So your design registration will not be challenged. It's also that the validity of a design registration, the question of the novelty of the design and the further requirements for the validity of a design registration often are complex and not easy to answer. So filing for a design which already is public uh, can be an option to consider even if there are no novelty grace periods available. Sometimes it may also make sense to file designs simply to create prior art. I have some examples here on this slide. You will probably agree that you have seen round sandwiches before, but since when? I don't know, but what I can tell you, um, they are prior art since April 1st, 2003. That's when this European registered community design was filed. Now, how do you want to file? Um, your filing options are filing nationally, regionally, or internationally. A national filing, of course, means national offices, national associates, national renewals, so it's all very costly. Costs are one of the most important things to consider when um, making up a decision uh, how to file. Uh, in addition to that, you should consider whether sophisticated drawings are allowed, whether you can defer a publication, how long it takes until you have an enforceable right, and whether there's, if you cover several countries, a risk of a central attack. What do I mean by sophisticated drawings? Um, I have some examples here on this slide. Uh, some of them are about showing what you want uh, protection for or what not. Others are about showing that a product has movable parts. That's the example in the first row uh, at the right-hand side, the smartphone. Um, others are specific to uh, things like graphical user interfaces uh, where you may want to file, um, as you can see it here on the slide, a little storyboard as uh, it's used in the movie industry uh, when uh, shooting a movie to show that you want protection for something on a screen that moves, as here the famous slide to unlock feature of 
um, a well-known uh, American smartphone manufacturer we all know. The best known example of regional design findings probably are European community designs. When comparing them to national design applications in the member states of the European Union, uh, the pros and cons are easily ex explained. It's uh, cheaper. Um, the EU office allows all kinds of sophisticated drawings. You can defer publication for up to 30 months, what is really great. Um, if you want to, uh, the European office registers and publishes within two to three business days, and you get an EU-wide right, uh, which if you find a court having jurisdiction for all EU member states, allows obtaining EU-wide decisions. The cons are only the 28 EU member states are in, not Switzerland, not Turkey, not Norway, not Russia, for example. And there's a risk of a central attack. If you rely on one filing, if you rely on one registration, if someone successfully challenges that registration, and that's something uh, that can be done very cheaply with the proceeding at the European uh, Community Office, uh, then you lose all rights. It's similar when comparing international design filings to national design filings. Also here, um, the obvious uh, advantage, it's more cost effective. Uh, if you want to, uh, my colleague Tim French just mentioned that, it can be registered and published very quickly. And, and here's an interesting uh, difference to international trademarks some of you uh, uh, might be familiar with. There's no risk of a central attack. Um, an international design doesn't need a base filing. Uh, it doesn't depend on the fate of that base filing. Um, so if someone want to, wants to challenge your international design registration, he'll have to do so in each and every jurisdiction. Some disadvantages. Uh, Jim Barbido mentioned that international designs are not available in all countries. Um, the drawings uh, will have to work for all countries. There is a workaround. I'll talk about that. A deferment will only work uh, if it's available for all countries uh, you are designating, and you may get refusals what may delay enforcement. Now, what about that workaround as far as the filings go? Here's an example. Um, the HAG agreement allows shading. Now, in some jurisdictions, that will be helpful uh, because uh, the uh, courts there are familiar and used to shading. In other jurisdictions, shading may be detrimental. It may reduce the scope of protection of your registration. For example, in countries where the courts adopt a literal approach and say, well, your registration only covers that design with those funny little lines on the display. Uh, I have no idea what they uh, are good for, but that's what your design registration covers. So um, what do you do? Uh, you will check with the local council for more important countries. You will come up with uh, different sets of drawings uh, uh, in line with the different requirements. And then you have two options. First thing is you throw all drawings in one big filing and then drop whatever isn't accepted or whatever doesn't make sense in a given jurisdiction. Or you bundle them and say, okay, uh, we have three buckets. One bucket is uh, with uh, sh uh, shading. Second bucket is uh, with shading and color. Uh, the third one is without shading, without color. I will file three international design applications the same day for those three buckets. I'll get three registrations. And Japan only will see what makes sense from a Japanese perspective. Um, an interesting trend uh, we've been seeing in the European Union, at least in the last couple of years, and I like also to quickly touch that, design filings for trademarks. Uh, we see uh, people filing uh, in parallel uh, both trademark applications and design filings. Examples are here on this slide. Now, does this make sense? Uh, is, that, is that abusive? Well, um, a design registration um, has to stand up to possible challenges based on its design. That means if you file um, a design application for a stylized word mark, it's the stylization of the word element which is relevant. And if you use a font which has been around for 100 years, well, 
then probably <clears throat> the validity of your design registration is questionable. Where you file a design application for a device mark that's all new and that hasn't been around anywhere uh, uh, before, well, then it's the design of that device element which is relevant. And if that's new and if that hasn't been there before, then you should have a chance to defend uh, the validity of that design registration. Some more examples uh, to explain situations where design filings may provide more leverage. As you know, where it comes to trademarks, um, for an infringement, you need a likelihood of confusion. For designs, at least that's the EU perspective, you need the same overall impression. Now, if you compare uh, these odd couples, couples here on the slide, are they confusingly similar? Well, I'm not sure because they clearly have different meanings thanks to the different word elements. Um, do they have the same overall impression as far as the design goes? I would say yes. And for that reason, I think if you file early enough for your new trademarks, uh, design filings might provide interesting options. Um, for um, you listening from New York, um, here is your um, CLE code. Um, the CLE code is, I'm sorry, I have to look it up. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Jan, it's, it um, <clears throat> it's 792. Those of you who have been watching the slides would have seen it on a few slides back. But code is 792 will be the code you'll need in New York uh, for CLE credit. Excellent, Jim. So I'll uh, hand it back to you then. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank, thank you, Tim. We've had a number of questions. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. We're going to take uh, time to answer these as we can, and uh, we will stay on to go uh, through further questions if we haven't answered your question. Um, obviously, you can also welcome to, uh, to uh, send us uh, an email. Uh, we will be posting the slides. Um, um, I will say that within the next 48 hours, uh, they should be posted at our website, fr.com. You can share them with uh, colleagues, et cetera, um, and you will receive a link um, uh, via email to the presentation recording when it becomes available. Uh, again, for those of you requesting uh, requiring CLE credit for New York and New Jersey, uh, make a note of course code 792. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll, <clears throat> there'll be a CLE, a New York CLE form that will be forwarded in a follow-up email. That's only for New York, New Jersey attorneys because of the requirements in their states. Um, so regarding questions, uh, there are a few questions that came in, uh, particularly with regard to drawings and what do you do if your drawings aren't sufficient for a country uh, when you file. I, I hope that Jan's presentation made it clear that these are things that have to be considered well in advance. You may not have the opportunities you have in a U.S. design application, for example, if you have a rejection based on drawings to make some amendments. Um, but instead, uh, you would file multiple sets of drawings, for example, in the same uh, international registration, each one tailored for particular country's requirements. Uh, as, as Jan mentioned, for example, South Korea will not allow shading uh, or will, will limit shading on drawings, whereas the U.S. may require shading in certain respects. Um, I think there were some other questions. Um, let's see here. Um, there was a, a, a question about, um, um, let's see, uh, can you file a, a Hague app design application as the initial uh, filing? In other words, do you need to, as a U.S. applicant, file a U.S. application first and then wait and file a Hague? No, you can file the Hague application as your first filing, similar to how you would file a PCT application in the utility context. Um, uh, someone asked whether or not um, uh, the broader con the broader approach to U.S. Uh, scope of protection, that is, for example, in having multiple embodiments and claiming the concept common to all of them, can still be obtained in the U.S. through the Hague. Um, again, our the Hague is really just opening to U.S. applicants now. Uh, we don't have a lot of cases, certainly, to, to judge by, but given the rules, my expectation would be 
that the, um, uh, the, the, the rules of the U.S. adopting the Hague limit what can be done through the Hague in the U.S. And therefore, if, if someone really wanted to pursue the more broad U.S. scope, um, I would recommend a U.S. direct filing um, in addition to whatever you do through the Hague. Um, let's see. We're, we're certainly at the top of the hour. Um, I'm trying to see if there's other... Uh, Jan, there was a question we had about what... Um, um, what the what the acronym, um, the RCD was in your slides? Is that simply the European Hague application, or is that something different? Um, yes, sorry for not explaining that. Um, RCD stands for Registered Community Design. Uh, that's a different name for an EU design registration, as you can file it with uh, the European. Uh, Office for Harmonization in the Internal Market in Alicante, Spain, uh, also called the Community Trademark Office or in a design context, the uh, um, European uh, Design Office. There was a question also about uh, what, what can be done if a, if a member country, a contacting state, uh, refuses a grant or, refu or submits a refusal and, and uh, you just can't get them uh, to agree to, to allow protection. Is there a petition process, for example. Either of you want to take that question? Well, I think if there was a petition process, then that would be within the, the local office. I think you, you could do the same thing, be in the same situation in the U.S. If your U.S. application was refused uh, you, you, at the 12 months, you would have the opportunity to prosecute it in the manner of a U.S. application uh, with the response and, the, and appeal and argument if you wanted to. With appeal to U.S. courts, ultimately, if you if you lose, but not oh, not an appeal to, to the IB. No, the IB the IB once the IB makes its determination, well, you wouldn't get to that point if you if the IB did not think your application was up to snuff as to form, you would not get an international registration. Right, and you but you would also not the IB would not serve as a as an appeal panel for refusals of national countries. That, no, that's once, when the applicant of a national once, country. Once they've made their decision to grant an international registration in the public application, they're done at that point. Okay. Well, just, just, to, just to quickly summarize a couple of key takeaway points, so those of you still on, um, this new process does not eliminate the need to confer with national associates and the countries of interest to make sure that the drawings as filed, in, in fact, it's critical that the drawings as filed be sufficient for protection in those various countries. Um, uh, and if it wasn't for the significant cost difference, um, I would think that a lot of U.S. applicants would just ignore uh, this new uh, process. But uh, we have wait, we still have to see how, how popular it will become. Uh, we as a firm have been looking into this for uh, the last year as the as we've approached this ratification of the treaty and and the patent office has been uh, promulgating its rules uh, we're comfortable with the process now and uh, we do believe that for some applicants for some designs it makes a lot of sense uh, but again it's not for every circumstance and it has its limits uh, we thank you for for taking the time with us today if you have any further questions again please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us and uh, we'd be happy to uh, try to help you have a great day.